So I am very pleased to introduce Farah Yi from the University of Michigan, who will tell us that um, Ulrich modules do not always exist. Farah. Okay, so thank you to Eloisa and Sean for inviting me. I actually want to start with a land grant acknowledgement first. Um, so I acknowledge I currently reside on the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Lenni and Lenape people who have stewarded this land for generations. I recognize the Lenape people as the stewards of this land and pay respect to Lenape people's past, present, and future, and their continuing presence in the homeland and throughout the Lenape diaspora. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, the title of the talk is Ulrich modules do not ooh, always exist. Um, great. So uh, basically in my talk, the setup is that I'm always going to be working over a local ring. And by local, I'm including the Noetherian condition. And for, yeah, no, for the entire talk, when I talk about um, a module M over R, it's always going to be finitely generated. Okay, so I'm going to start with kind of the outline of the talk, which is uh, I'm first going to cover some definitions and basic properties that I'm using, just so that everyone is pretty much on the same page. Then I will give some motivations. Um, and perhaps ooh, some applications. And then I'm going to give a survey of major existence results. Then I will get to the counterexample to existence. And maybe if there's time, I will show you that I can get a pretty nice counterexample to localization using this counterexample. And then finally, I'll end with some open questions. Okay. So that's the outline. Let's start with some definitions. Um, just so that we're clear, again, this is local, it's Noetherian. I'm not going to say any of this again. Uh, M is always going to be a finitely generated module over R. Okay, so first I should define what an Ulrich module is. And for us to do that, I need to define what a maximal co macaulay module is. So for maximal co-Macaulay module, I'm always going to use MCM. Um, so what does that mean? So M is module, sorry, give me a second. Uh, it's a module over R, okay? Then M is maximal co-Macaulay. So again, I'm going to denote this MCM if the depth of M is equal to the dimension of R. Okay, And kind of a useful fact that I'm going to be using, which is pretty much equivalent, is that every part of, or really just system of parameters of R is a part of an M sequence. So we'll also need to know what the Hilbert Samuel multiplicity is. And I will be denoting this Hilbert Samuel mult. Okay. And so in the setup where I have M a module again over R, um, yeah, the Hilbert Samuel multiplicity. of M with respect to the maximal ideal little m 
is this number, emn, which is equal to d factorial, the limit as n goes to infinity, the length of m mod m n m over n to the d. Where I should be clear, d is equal to the dimension of the module, which is the quill dimension of r mod and rm. Okay. So just recall, I mean, this limit kind of looks scary, but it's not because uh, this function, so my function would just be n going to length of m mod m n m. Uh, this agrees with a polynomial uh, in the variable n of, or yeah, of degree d, which again is the dimension of m uh, for n greater or equal to zero. And in fact, I should say with leading term, um, it's gonna look something like some positive integer over uh, d factorial, okay, or n to the d. All right, so I'm gonna outline some useful facts that I'll be using, some useful facts. Sorry, let me know if I'm scrolling down too quickly. Is that, oh, and also I'm just gonna point out that I'm using this notation, but I switch notation a lot. So uh, E M M, this is, I can also write that as E R M. And if I ever write E R, this is actually just going to be equal to just this, all right? All right, so some useful facts. One, um, I can actually compute what this is in terms of the rank of R M times E M R. And actually, I suppose it's even better for me to say that I'm actually just gonna assume this is a local domain for the rest of the talk. Just so that this notion of rank, I don't really have to explain what it is. This is just the vector space dimension of frac R tensor R M. Okay. And another useful fact is uh, let I and M be, okay. So let me just be clear here. I also am gonna take K to be infinite um, just so that anything I say about minimal reductions, there won't be any confusion there. It doesn't really matter. I can always, ten well, for my purposes, it doesn't matter. I can always tensor make the field infinite. Um, but just to be clear, I am assuming that K is infinite, okay? And so I and M, let's say this is a minimal reduction. Um, so that means there exists some N such that M to the N plus one is equal to I M N, okay? Then I can actually compute the multiplicity of M as the length of M mod I M um, if M is maximal Kolmogorov. So the reason I wanna do that is, I know it's like so long to get to defining what an Ulrich module is, but I promise we're almost there. So proposition is if M is in maximal Kolmogorov module over R, then I have this nice bound where the multiplicity of M with respect to R is an upper bound for the minimal generators of, um, of M, okay? So this is just minimal generators, number or minimum number of generators, I'll say. Okay, and this is actually pretty simple, um, right? Oh, sorry, I should say proof. 
if I start with the multiplicity, right, this is equal to the length of uh, m mod i m, where i is going to be a minimal reduction. And that's going to be greater or equal to the length of m mod m m. And of course, this here is the minimal number of generators. Okay. All right. So finally, we get to the definition of the object of interest, which is what is an Ulrich module. And it's also historically been called maximally generated maximal co Macaulay module for a good reason. So M is Ulrich if one um, M is a maximal co Macaulay module and two, it's maximally generated. And so it actually hits this upper bound. Okay, so this is not common in the literature, at least I don't think it is. But when I say something like the Ulrich condition, I'm referring to this maximal generation. Um, I'll also, so this is not standard. Uh, I'll also maybe call this like the Ulrichness of stuff. All right, and a very useful, like perhaps obvious characterization, so observation is, okay, let's say M is maximal co Macaulay, okay? Then M is Ulrich, if and only if MM is equal to IM for any minimal reduction I contained in M. And again, the proof of this is pretty simple. Okay, so observe. All right, we have E of M, right? This is equal to the length of M mod I M. And this length is equal to the length of M mod M M plus the length of M M over I M, right? And of course this is just minimal number of generators plus this length, okay? So then M is Ulrich, so if and only if ERM right, is equal to the number, minimal number of generators, if and only if this length is equal to zero, if and only if mm is equal to i m. All right, and I'll be using this characterization later, um, but I'll be sure to point out that that's what I'm doing. Are there any questions at this point? Please. All right, great. So let's move on to, sorry, just let me check the time, okay. So let's move on to the second part, which is, okay, so I know what an Ulrich module is. It's a maximal co macaulay module. This really nice bound on the number of generators and an Ulrich module is just something where I have as many possible generators. Um, I'm hitting, the number of generators is actually hitting that upper bound, okay? So what are the motivations and kind of applications of why we should care about Ulrich modules? Um, so Ulrich modules were introduced in 1984 by Bernd Ulrich, and he did not call them Ulrich modules. And the reason was he wanted to, uh, he wanted to answer, you know, when is a co Macaulay, local co Macaulay ring, Gorenstein, And he observed, or rather he proved that, hey, if R has the special type of module, then I can build a condition um, for when a co macaulay ring is Gorenstein. So uh, it's kind of confusing because I wanna say 
burnt proof this, but I'm also writing Ulrich modules for Ulrich. So, so proved if R has an Ulrich module, then R is Gorenstein if and only if this X was zero for uh, I from one to the dimension of R. So even before we think about, you know, is this, you know, is this a useful criterion? Is it easier to compute? Uh, there was kind of a problem, perhaps, well, that's kind of the problem, first problem that I would see is that uh, it's really, it's really hard to find Ulrich modules. Nevertheless, you know, one might be like, okay, so it's been really hard to find Ulrich modules. Why might we care about them? Um, and I just want to say that the existence of Ulrich modules for complete local domains has really powerful implications. It would imply Sarah's conjecture. Uh, I'm going to write a Sarah's positivity for intersection multiplicities. And Lex conjecture. And both of these are long standing open conjectures um, that have people have worked on for many, many years. Uh, I'm not going to get into Sarah's positivity because you don't really need all richness here. Um, just finding maximal co Macaulay modules is enough. Um, but Lex conjecture here, you do use all richness. Do use all richness. Um, or at least that's one of the approaches for Lex conjecture. Okay, so let me state what Lex conjecture is. And this was conjectured in the 1960s. Okay, so what it says is, okay, let's say I have a very nice map of local rings. So I have R, M, K going to S and L where, so let me say this is a flat local map. And so particular maximal ideal of R is mapping into the maximal ideal of S. Then the Hilbert Samuel multiplicity with respect to R is less than or equal to the Hilbert Samuel multiplicity of S. Okay, so this is a pretty innocuous statement, um, or at least it's innocuous looking. And I guess if you look at different similar properties such as Hilbert Kuhn's multiplicity, this is actually true. Uh, but it's been quite elusive uh, for a Hilbert Samuel multiplicity. And Lex conjecture is actually not known in too many cases. Uh, I, there was a recent paper by Lin Chuan Ma where he actually manages to prove this for a very large class of rings. Uh, Let me kind of illustrate the timeline for you. So Lech in 1960 was able to prove that it holds as long as the dimension of the ring is at least two. And then Ma in 2018 proved that, okay, in the equicharacteristic case, um, I can prove it for dimension R is equal to three. And the way he does this is the proof uses reduction to care P methods. To get a much better bound. And the bound that Lin Chuan gets is that the multiplicity of R 
is less than or equal to the max of one d factorial over two to the d times the multiplicity of s and where d is the dimension of the ring. So d is the dimension of r. And so one might wonder what's so special about the case where the dimension is three. Well, if I just plug it in, right? So if I plug in three, I get EMR is less than or equal to the max of one six eighths times ENS. And of course, this is just the multiplicity of S. Okay. So in this 2018 paper, it takes a lot of hard work to get this bound. And so one might want another approach to the problem. And just recently in 2020, again, a result of Ma, is that if I have standard graded rings over a perfect field, um, then we have Lex conjecture. And the strategy here is to use um, weakly limb Ulrich modules, which I won't describe, but this is what I mean by Ulrichness. Uh, Ulrichness, capture some notion of Ulrichness to get to uh, a strategy for attacking Lex conjecture. Okay, so now that I've done that, and it's pretty much wide open for any other case. So I said that we are using Ulrichness as a strategy towards Lex conjecture. So I'm just going to show why having an Ulrich module would imply Lex conjecture. So first, you know, it is known that we can reduce to the case where one, R is a complete local domain, and two, that the dimension of R is equal to the dimension of S, call that D. Um, so in particular, MS is primary to NS, okay? And so the claim is that if R and S satisfy, you know, the conditions, so we've reduced to this case. Um, so if R has an Ulrich module, then Lex conjecture holds. Okay, so let's see where we're using the Ulrichness here. So first, let M be Ulrich over R. So again, this means that M is maximal co-Macaulay and that the multiplicity of M is equal to the number of generators of M. Okay, so what we have is, let's look at EMR, right? This is one over the rank of R of M times the generator, no, or I should be careful, times E M M, right? Because before, uh, when I say the basic properties, I just wrote this quantity as the rank of M times the multiplicity of R, okay? And that's the same thing as the rank of M as, uh, of this, okay? And of course, because M is Ulrich, I can switch this multiplicity of M to the number of generators with respect to R. So now I have one over rank S, S tensor RM times, that's the same as this. 
And then this is going to be less than or equal to the rank S of S tensor RM times the multiplicity of, I guess I'll just write it as S of this. And again, using the same trick as before, this is just the multiplicity of S. So I'm using the Ulrichness precisely here and the rest just kind of follows through, all right? Okay, but unfortunately, you know, so we're like, okay, maybe it's good that we can find these, if we can find these Ulrich modules for huge classes of rings, we'll have uh, Lex conjecture. But, you know, the whole point of my talk is that there's now a counterexample for the complete local case. And so one might wonder, okay, well, what's the point? Um, and I think the idea is we don't need Ulrich, but some we do need, but can use kind of notions that approximate Ulrich modules. So approximate Ulrichness. And that's precisely what Linchuan does, or Linchuan Ma does in his paper with weakly Ulrich things, uh, weakly limb Ulrich sequences. But I'm going to give kind of a soft example of what I mean by we just need to approximate uh, Ulrichness. So a soft example would be, so this was an observation in 1999 in Haines's thesis. Okay. So the, if this is, if we have a sequence of MCM modules such that the number of generators over the multiplicity um, of each n goes to one. So as we go, as n gets bigger and bigger, I'm getting closer and closer to something that's looking more and more Ulrich uh, than Lex conjecture holds. And Basically, the proof is pretty much exactly the same as this proof. It's super similar. Um, so I'll just leave that as an exercise. All right. So are there any questions so far? All right. So one remark I want to make is that sometimes I'm asked, OK, so Ulrich is a super strong condition. But if I satisfy Lex conjecture, um, do I? Do I have an Ulrich module or is there something like that? And um, just a short answer to that is that no, uh, the counterexample that I have is in dimension two and Lex already proved uh, Lex conjecture for dimension two. Okay. So I probably won't write that remark. All right, so let's move on. So let's look at a survey of kind of the major existence results. And unfortunately, it's been a very difficult problem to find Ulrich modules or to prove that there are Ulrich modules uh, for large classes of rings. And so the first was in 1987 by Brennan, Herzog, and Ulrich. And this was when R is standard graded. two-dimensional Comacaulay domain, and the K is infinite. Okay, and then the next breakthrough was in 1991, which was by Herzog, Ulrich, and Bakalin, where they proved that if R is a strict complete intersection, then you have Ulrich modules, strict, complete. And what does I, what do I mean by strict, complete intersections? I just mean that the associated graded ring um, is a complete intersection. Okay. So that was 1991. 
And as far as I know, the next kind of big breakthrough came more than a decade later in 2003. Um, so I do want to mention that also in 1999, Douglas Haynes had some cases as well. Uh, but in 2003, I guess the big, big result is from Eisenbud, Schreier, and Wyman. And again, this is in characteristic zero, I want to be clear, uh, all Veronese subrings of the polynomial ring. And then finally, in 2004, we have this Bruns, Romer, and Viva. And they did generic determinantal rings. Okay, and that is pretty much it. Um, there are some results in kind of more special cases, but these are kind of the big major existence results. Okay. Do you have any questions there? Okay, great. So now let's actually get to the counterexample, right? So the theorem, I suppose, is that all rich modules do not always exist for complete local domains, but the counterexample I'm going to show you I'm not going to you show it's not going to be complete, but if you take the obvious complete ring, um, then it's like the exact same argument. And the reason I'm not going to use the complete version is just because I want to save some notational labor, I suppose, for another the cool localization counterexample. So just I know I said complete the same exact arguments work. Um, in this case, so let's. All right, so what is the counterexample? Well, the counterexample is this monomial algebra. All right, let me count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay where M, I'm localizing it at the obvious maximal ideal, and N is greater or equal to two. Um, just for simplicity, again, the arguments for when N is greater or equal to three are exactly the same. You have to do a slight modification for N equals two, but essentially it's the same. Uh, so for simplicity, I'm gonna stick with N equals three. And I claim that this is a counterexample. And so in order for me to prove that this is a counterexample, I actually need to understand what all the maximal co-Macaulay modules over this thing are. Um, or at least that was my approach. So question then, how can we classify MCM modules over R? So the trick is to actually bump to a larger ring and that ring will end up being regular. It'll just end up being KXY localized at XY. Um, and then we know what all the NCM modules are, okay? So the proposition is, okay, let's have RMK. Uh, let's say this is an excellent local domain. If you don't know what excellent is, just think of this as, uh, you know, we can just think of the proposition as a complete local domain. Okay. Let S be the S2ification of R. All right. If S is local, then any 
MCM module M over R is an MCM module over S. Okay. And so let me just write this. Recall um, the S twoification, right? So the S twoification of S, or the S twoification S rather, of R is a module finite extension. Extension. R S such that for any element that is an S but not an R, the ideal R F equal to so this ideal is just all the stuff in R that multiplies F into R. This ideal is height two, or height at least two. So height greater or equal to two. So what I want to prove is that, okay, if I go to this larger ring, then, uh, and it's local, then any maximal co-Macaulay over R is a maximal co-Macaulay module over S. So let's do the proof. So the observation that I want, so let's make M maximal co-Macaulay over R. Um, it's enough to show that I can actually think of M as an S module. So it's enough to show that for any F that's an S, but not an R, we have our, sorry. Oh no. Okay. And M and M, um, I'll say there's a well-defined action um, F times M, okay. All right, well, the height of this ideal, so again, this is all stuff in R that multiplies f into the ring is at least two. So this means there exists some uv uh, in here such that uv is part of a system of parameters for r. Okay. But m is maximal co-Macaulay. So m, mcm, what this means is that, okay, UV is regular on M, okay? So I do understand that perhaps this multiplication might be a bit funny, but if you just look at frac R tensor M, all of this will work out. But if I take V times UF, the element UF, and R and M, this is equivalent to U times the element VF, okay? And this is in VN, all right? And what that's going to imply is that I have VF times M is going to be in here. And so, you know, let N be an M such that VF times M is equal to V times N, and then define this action F times M to be N. Okay. Are any questions? Okay, wonderful. So now what I can do is if my s 2 is local, I can now look at a bigger ring. And in this case, so back to the counter example, it's really nice, all right? So let me just recall what R is. And I'm localizing it at the obvious maximal ideal. Okay, so this is sitting inside S, which is 
this. And what we notice is that x cubed and y cubed multiply x into r, right? And similarly, y into r and x cubed, y cubed, these generate a height two uh, ideal. So what that's telling me is that, okay, x, y are in the S2ification. And so the S2ification must be this normal ring. So S is the S2ification. Okay, so now I just need to consider maximal co-Macaulay modules over S, but what are they? Well, MCM modules over S look like something like this, right? And so it is enough to show that S itself is not Ulrich over R. Okay. All right, so after you do a bunch of computations, what you can show is that xy, x cubed minus y cubed, this is a minimal reduction in R. And so I want to remind you that the property we want to use is that uh, if M is maximal co-Macaulay, then M Ulrich, if and only if MM is equal to IM, where I is a minimal reduction. In this case, all it is is, is this ideal in S? So ideal generated by these things equal to this other ideal in S. Question mark, and the answer is no. For example, this thing doesn't, ooh, maybe. Okay, so I think that's the correct orientation. Sometimes I get confused. All right, so they're not equal because I don't have x cubed, for example, on the left-hand ideal. And what this is, this just means that um, S is not Ulrich over R, and so R has no Ulrich matrix. And again, if I just take, if I just complete, same argument works. Anyone have any questions? Okay, so I have a bit of time left. Uh, this is actually, I can use this counterexample to give me a nice counterexample for localization. So counterexample. And a counterexample was known to Douglas Haynes at least in his 1999 thesis. So, but kind of the interesting thing here is that um, this counterexample is interesting because I'm going to start with a ring that does have an Ulrich module and then localize it at an interesting prime, I guess, and end up with the counterexample that I just showed you. Okay. So let's take R. Um, I'm sorry for interrupting. So, so yes. just to clarify, so Haynes had a counterexample to localization. Okay. So if I have an Ulrich module M over R, once I localize, is MP going to be Ulrich over RP? And the answer was no. But his counterexample localized to a ring that had other Ulrich modules. Thanks. Okay, so I'm going to take this funny, basically all I'm doing is I'm just sticking an S and putting everything up to degree four, and then I'm sticking an S fourth into the counterexample. And again, localized is the obvious thing. So oh, this is contained here. And if I call this, oh, sorry, this should be an S thing. So localized at SXY. If I call this phi, then if I take the prime P, oh, which equals phi inverse 
x, y, okay? Then I'm gonna look at RP, right? And RP, when I localize, is gonna look like this ring. So I just, it's still a field, but perhaps it looks enlarged, All right? Um, so it's basically just the counterexample. If I can actually get around to writing it correctly with all these fractions. And let me count one, two, three, four, five. I'm missing something. Aha. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay. All right. And so I'm telling you that when I localize at this prime, I'm getting back to my counterexample. Uh, but I need to show you that R has an Ulrich module. And it does. And the reason is, OK, so if I look at R, then it's also contained in this Veronese. Uh, I should be 4, localized at, I guess, SXY. Or, you know, the obvious thing here. All right, so it's not really hard to compute, but you can show that ER is equal to 16 equal to ES, and the rank of S over R, they have the same faction field, so it's just going to be 1, okay? So, um, yeah. So Douglas Haynes' result, and honestly, I guess like, I didn't state what Douglas Haynes' result for Veronese's were, but he has a more general result where the characteristic of the field is not limited. But uh, since I only listed Eisenbud, Schreier, and Wyman's result, let's just say the characteristic is zero. Uh, this, this has an Ulrich module. Okay. All right, so let's say M. So then M is maximal co-Macaulay over R. So now I have 16, right, which is the multiplicity, rank R M. This is the same thing as the multiplicity of M, okay? And I want this to be equal, right? But this, the number of generators of R, like over the bigger ring, you should have the same or less number of generators. And of course, it's Ulrich over S, so that all works out. Okay. So this shows that ERM is equal to the number of generators, and M is Ulrich for R. Okay. So that's that counterexample. And so let me just say some drawbacks of the counterexamples that I've talked about. Uh, counterexample is not co Macaulay, right? Otherwise, if you're calling Macaulay, if you're S2, you can't really go to a larger ring. Um, and so perhaps one easy open question to pose is. Do all co Macaulay rings, or rather co Macaulay domains, local, have an Ulrich module? Okay. And I'm just going to stop my talk there. Are there any questions? You ended right when I was writing down some notes about questions that I wanted to ask. Oh, okay. <laughs> Any questions for Farah? Can I, I'll jump in with one. Yeah, go. Yeah. Um, this is Daniel. Um, is there, so given, I mean, given the recent counter examples, is there any reason to be optimistic that the question would be, have a positive answer? I mean, it, um, somehow, it somehow was a bold, thing to believe to begin with that so when i pose the question i think i mean for me personally i'm searching for a counterexample in the co case 
Um, it's quite difficult um, just because one, it's probably you, you know, in dimension two, things seem to be pretty well understood. So you want to go to dimension three. And then all these notions of like, can we understand MCM modules get extremely wacky. Uh, so I personally think that it shouldn't. There should be a counterexample. Um, but, you know, for example, there are a lot of people studying Ulrich bundles and they have a huge open question there. Whereas where if you have like a smooth projective variety, do I have an Ulrich bundle? Um, and I don't know. So I think the point is that I don't know. And I think definitely it's probably not likely just because that would imply like existence. Yeah, I'm just going to say, yeah. Um, it would be good to know for sure, but I definitely don't think that it's likely. Can I ask the kind of a combinatorial question? Sure. Is there a combinatorics interpretation for the counterexample that you found? Like, is there some kind of like, I don't know, graph associated to the exponents or some other like combinatorial reason that would give you to think about that? Really? So I will kind of not answer. I'll give a non-answer, which is no, I don't know a straightforward combinatorial thing, but knowing the kind of research you do, there's actually kind of a, like there are equivalent um, conditions for Ulrich modules. For example, they're also called linear maximal co-Macaulay modules. And you can describe the same kind of Ulrichness um, with like, there's like a linear resolution. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. So perhaps you could find one. <laughs> well, it just, you know, it's a monomial algebra. I'm like kind of super tempted to try to draw some graphs and see if something. Yeah. I mean, that would, if you could give that, that would be great. Yeah. Well, I mean, anybody could. Do oh, that. anybody. I, okay. Yeah, anybody. Like I'm, um, I don't, I'm not taking more work of myself right now, but if anybody has a combinatorial interpretation, that would be cool. Yeah. Other questions? I've got one more. Um, yeah, sure. This is Daniel again. Um, you alluded to this a bit, but there's this active uh, kind of parallel research looking for Ulrich bundles and Ulrich sheaves on varieties, projective schemes, things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Does your does your can your counterexample be translated into that language in in some form? And I couldn't quite try to do it in real time. But have yeah, you so that angle? I did think about this a little bit. And I don't think geometrically it's very interesting. So I guess like going to the localization counterexample, it's a bit more intuitive. Like you can kind of see what's going on. So you start with like a Veronese and then you like take a linear projection and then <laughs> look at some kind of affine thing for that. But I'm not sure, like I don't, that's certainly not smooth. I'm not sure um, if there's anything interesting going on geometrically uh, that would help with the types of questions that. Yeah. I mean, people um, are interested in the non-smooth case too. It's, oh, uh, I did not know that. Never, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, you know, it's been, it's known, I believe if it's not smooth, they need to be certainly, there are some examples known where if the, the variety is not smooth, you might need a, a sheaf or maybe it's, but, but I mean, the question, there was no known counterexample for any projective scheme. I mean, not, mm. just, not just smooth things, right? As long as you kind of adapted the definitions correctly. Um, it seemed to be an open question uh, where, where the kind of existence, non-existence line should be drawn. So even if it's not smooth, I think it'd be an interesting angle to kind of poke around in. Other questions? Some great questions. So does your counterexample give any insight into the general question of existence of small cone Macaulay? Um, I don't think so. <laughs> I think it doesn't tell you anywhere to possibly look for a counterexample to that one. Uh, not to like, yes. So I don't think so. I haven't quite played with it 
Um, I guess one way to do it is to, there is this thing where if you have, yeah, so the technique where you bump up to the s 2 ification uh, if your s 2 ification is not local, then there might be some issues there. Mm -hmm. But I suppose that if you could find kind of large classes of rings where you can bump up to an s 2 ification that makes sense, like it's regular, for example, then you could try something there uh, and see if some condition goes wrong. But I don't think, yeah, so I don't know. I think for maximal co macaulay modules, it's just pretty much mysterious. Um, there's even for Veronese rings, if you go up to like three variables and look there, um, I'm not sure if there are any good classifications or understanding of what the picture is going on there. So no, I don't think this would point too much towards um, understanding like just MCM modules, but maybe if Mel is in the, in yeah. the room. I, would, I don't think it's going to give a counterexample to MCM modules, but uh, Farah is trying some things where you, starting with her counterexample, uh, it suggests Cohn Macaulay things to look at where there might not be an Ulrich module. Mm. Nice. But I don't want to go into more detail about that. <laughs> That's Teaser. very clever thing she does. Yeah. Uh, so it, you know, it's wide open for Toric rings, whether. Well, Okay. There are Ulrich modules. Uh, and, you know, you'd think that case might be doable, and that's a strongly combinatoric uh, issue to look at. Uh, but uh, her counterexample suggests a class of normal Toric rings to look at where there might not be Ooh. an Ulrich module. So uh, it's still going to be very difficult to prove that there's no Ulrich module. Because how do you, you know, there's no known obstruction. Mm. But you can maybe prove that there's no Ulrich module satisfying certain extra conditions. Mm -hmm. That seems more approachable. Nice. And that, that's as much as I would say. Cool. Any other questions? All right, let's thank Farah again.